For the last two months, I've been working on a bit of a puzzle. See, I originally picked up an X18 a while back to do a review after I saw how cheap the device was selling here in China. I was super excited to do a review, but I wasn't at all pleased with the Chinese UI and the bloatware that this thing ships with, so I returned it. Another user on Discord had managed to break his device, so I bought another unit to try and help him, and I ended up going down the long and winding path that got me here. Hello everyone, my name is Taki, and today I'm going to be taking a look at the new and improved Powkitty X18 running stock Android. Let me quickly get one thing out of the way. Due to the nature of this release, I will be following up this video with an installation guide for this firmware in the next couple of days for new and existing users of this device, so keep an eye out. Now, let's do a rundown on the specs of this device. The Powkitty X18 is powered by an MTK8163 chip clocked at 1.3GHz and a Mali T720 GPU with 2GB of DDR3 RAM, 16GB of internal storage, and a 5000mAh battery. For display, we have a 720p 5.5 inch touchscreen panel with support for HDMI out through the back of the unit. This unit supports 802.11 BGN Wi-Fi and Bluetooth 4.0 running on top of a customized Android 7 firmware that we will finally be able to replace. At first glance, it's pretty obvious to see where Powkitty got their inspiration for this device. This thing is clearly modeled after the successful XD line of devices and the price of this unit directly competes with both of those devices for market share, albeit pretty poorly due to the locked nature of the firmware that this thing ships with. The X18 is a clamshell design with a textured lid that holds an LED light in the center. On the perimeter of the unit, we have our stereo speakers and headphone jack on the front of the device with our remaining I.O. on the back. The back of the unit holds our dual shoulder buttons, TF card slot, HDMI out, and USB port. These last three are fairly standard, so I'm going to only focus on the shoulder buttons for now. If you've watched any of my other videos, you know that I'm partial to shoulder buttons that don't operate on a hinge. This device unfortunately does use a hinge for the L1 and R1 buttons, and it's a pretty deep one. You have to press this button down a little farther than most of the devices that I've tested on this channel, and it takes a little while to get used to. These shoulder buttons also don't feel as sturdy as the other devices that I've covered so far. The L2 and R2 buttons, on the other hand, are pretty much what I'd expect to see on something like this. They're small and unobtrusive, and the entire button can be pressed down without any of the janky appearance as the other two buttons. The profile of this device is pretty thin, comparable to other clamshell devices on the market, and while it is pocketable, I really wouldn't advise using that as a means for transportation. Opening up the device and we find one of the key highlights of this unit. The display on this unit is pretty big with a low to medium pixel density and a bright backlit display. On the stock firmware, you have the ability to have your software keys on the right or the bottom of the screen, but I've opted to use a software mod to completely remove these from the screen in order to maximize screen real estate. A big con for this device is that it has a rather low resolution of 720p by today's standards, but it does work well for the systems and apps that run well on this device, so I don't really mind. The hinge on this top half is also fairly sturdy with two locking positions that this thing can be adjusted to. I thought that I wouldn't mind not being able to have this device open up completely, but I found that there are times where the maximum extension wasn't enough in certain instances, but that's down to personal preference. Looking below the display and we can find our second highlight of this unit, the dual analog sticks on this device are pretty top notch and that's a good thing because the D-pad leaves a lot to be desired. These things come with a removable grip and besides the fact that it's a lint magnet, it provides an excellent grip. I use these two sticks in any application where mapping these makes sense because they are just that good. That being said, this thing doesn't support L3 or R3 in any capacity without button remapping, so that can be a downside depending on what you want to run. In the middle of these two sticks, we have our volume keys, mapping key, power button, and hardware phone keys. Like I've already mentioned, I've turned off the software keys because these things do a pretty good job at what they do. There isn't really anything too special about these keys except for the mapping button, but I'll go into that in more depth later in this video. This leaves us with the D-pad, and I've gone back and forth on this. Like I've already mentioned, I've been using the joysticks for any application that supports their use, which is pretty much everything. I do use the D-pad in some emulators and games, but this is pretty much just to fire off one ability or action, so I don't have much time using this as a means of navigation. It wasn't until I was using an application that was 100% reliant on using the D-pad for movement that I saw just how bad this thing really is. 
The D-pad is pretty mushy, and when you use it for movement in games, you are going to find that the whole thing is pretty much completely pressed down the entire time you use it. 3D printers being as cheap as they are here, I've considered trying to print another one to mod it into this device, but I can get by with this the way that it is for the applications that I use. The good news here is that the ABXY keys are actually pretty decent. The next most obvious thing that will annoy people is the huge Powkitty logo on the lip of this unit. I've already read a few comments about this, and I will say that you are in luck. This thing can be easily removed, but you're going to need to find something to fill the space. I haven't found a suitable replacement for this yet, but I am open to suggestions. This leaves us with our headphone jack and speakers. The headphone jack is thankfully located on the front of the device, and you can judge the audio quality of this in other parts of this video. I will just quickly test the stereo speakers on this unit by recording directly from the front of the device at 50% volume. I don't feel like reflashing the stock firmware just to show you how bad it is, but I will point out some of the negatives of the original device. This thing ships with a launcher that is pretty terrible. You can change it to something else, but the device tends to reset any changes to the launcher on reboot. This device also ships with a bunch of Chinese bloatware. Besides this, it's impossible to get Google Play services on this device without having it repeatedly crash on you. I've tried every combination of APKs I could find online and every combination of Chinese APKs that install Google Play services on MTK chips with no success. During this time, I spent over three weeks pleading with Palkitty to either release the source code for this system or release a stock Android build that we could use in the meantime while we get a development build set up for Lineage OS. All of that back and forth work led to the firmware that you see on screen right now. This system uses a patched boot partition for systemless root. It comes with the full suite of Google Play services and the bootloader can be unlocked, although there is no benefit in doing so at this time as we don't have any way of getting TWRP to run on this device. I will say that TWRP isn't really necessary with the software options that we have on an MTK chip, but I will go over that more in my installation guide for this system. I've tried to install a little bit of everything on this system, but I will say that it's very difficult for me to test Android-based systems here in China. Using any Google-based systems or applications requires a VPN, so I've had to sideload a client to install most of what you're going to see here right now. I've also sideloaded a few other applications on this device as I made a new Google account just for this system for privacy reasons and I didn't want to repurchase some applications. I would advise anyone else to do the same thing until we have lineage releases for this device. For gaming, I'm going to be going over GameCube, Dreamcast, DS, PSP, PS1, and N64 with a mix of other titles that I also enjoy. Before we jump into GameCube, I will say that as it currently stands, this device isn't really powerful enough to get decent performance out of non-2D games. This system is lacking a specific OpenGL extension which would make this possible, but that would require code that we don't have access to at this moment. What we will be able to do, however, is overclock the CPU to 1.5GHz, which should make this and every other emulation system on this device run much better. The best performance that I was able to get out of the GameCube emulator came from the MMJ build of this emulator with stock settings. The games that I tested the most were Wind Waker, Super Mario Sunshine, and Smash. Unfortunately, Smash is the only title that I would consider playable based on my tests. This requires you to mess around with some of the custom settings, but you should be able to get this to play at 20 to 25 FPS on certain stages. Wind Waker runs at around 10 to 15 FPS, but I did accidentally find a combination one time that got this to run at 20 FPS. I should note, I have the CPU governor set to performance mode for all of the tests that you will see in this video. I don't have footage for Super Mario Sunshine anymore, but that was the worst game that I tested, failing to break even above 10 FPS. Needless to say, this device is not meant for GameCube as it currently stands. From my tests, DS also runs very well on this system, but DSs are so cheap these days that I don't really see anyone picking up this device just to play that system. I will say that I had no issues running any Pokemon titles if that's what you're interested in playing. PlayStation is another system that runs without any issues on this device. I tested Final Fantasy IX, Crash Bandicoot, and Tekken 2 and 3 all without any problems. From here, let's move on to Dreamcast. I tried to get Recast to work on this system, and maybe someone else will have better luck than me, but I just didn't want to map any of my buttons correctly. The whole menu is just one big cluster, and I only ever got it to let me map the A, B, X, Y buttons once, but never the D-pad or analog sticks. I also tried a RetroArch core for this, but I prefer to use standalone applications for more demanding titles. 
Using Redream, I was able to get good performance on this device running Evolution and Sonic Adventure. Although it's not the primary reason why I would use this device, a lot of people are also concerned with PSP performance. I pulled together a selection of titles for this to give you a good overview of what you could expect from this device. I will say that for more demanding titles like God of War, you will need to customize your settings until you get something that's suitable for you. The titles that I'm most interested in are the Monster Hunter series, Final Fantasy Type-0, and Fantasy Star. I've enabled the FPS meter for all of the tests that you're going to see so you can see how they're running. <laughs> That brings us over to N64, and this is a system that I think runs really well on this device. The only game that I had trouble getting to run on this was Rogue Squadron, which is a little bit of a bummer. I managed to get this to play on an earlier build of the firmware, but I've had no luck on getting this to run on anything other than Retroarch, and the performance there wasn't that great. You will have to customize the emulation profile slightly for your device, but I'm going to be using the Glide Accurate setting for almost everything you see here. I have a few Android games on this device that I think benefit from the onboard controls. When you're in any application, all you need to do is press the Google button and you'll get a proprietary screen mapping software on screen that allows you to modify how your buttons will act with the touchscreen. I've mapped several of the spells to the right keys and a few of the quick actions to the shoulder buttons. Because the D-pad isn't that great, I only map things that are used infrequently like spell upgrades. That being said, I prefer the Chinese version of this game more due to the lower latency, but even with this old chip, I'm still able to play without any issues in bigger team fights. I also tested out some AAA titles on this device, but the performance was pretty bad so I removed them. You can still find a host of games that will run well on this system if you look. I tested popular titles like Minecraft, Terraria, and Apple Knight, all without any issues. I do have a fairly large Steam library on my PC that I would like to test out on this device. I want to preface this by saying that I don't have 5GHz Wi-Fi to test this with, so you should be able to get better performance than I did in my tests. During these tests, I tried to recreate and investigate some of the bigger issues that I read about with this unit. First and foremost, the screen refresh rate on my unit is set to a little over 60Hz with a refresh rate of 61Hz. I'm unsure if this can be fixed with a software update, but I wasn't really able to notice this in any of my tests. The next issue was ghosting, and this is something that I never really came across, and now that I know how to recreate it, it is something that you really have to go looking for. Another YouTuber pointed out this months ago in an attempt to try and get the company to address this issue, but what he and other people need to realize about the developers of these devices is that most of them contract out the work to other companies to do the work for them. Most of these developers have no idea what's actually going on on the devices that they sell or how they work. Not to mention the fact that YouTube is not very common in China and they probably aren't going to YouTube to find out what people think about their products. 
I have been able to unfortunately recreate this exact same issue that he found on this stock build, so this is clearly the result of poor drivers for the joysticks and buttons. I don't want to make any promises, but this should be a solvable task considering all of the work that was done to develop the system that you see in this video right now. Outside of this, there is an issue with latency in both HDMI out for more demanding emulation titles and Bluetooth audio. I was originally concerned that this Bluetooth latency would also translate over to controllers, but I haven't noticed any latency issues out of the ordinary when pairing my 8-bit do lights with the X18. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this review and showcase of the new stock ROM. I've historically been a person who buys devices like this one with shitty software, and I always find myself holding out for the slim chance that it could one day get better. Finally getting software that makes this device usable, and the fact that it is actually a decent system for its price is out of the ordinary. Stuff like this just doesn't happen. If you like this product and you'd like to get one for yourself, links are in the description box below. I'm hoping that this video and product gets enough attention that we will hopefully be able to get the source code required to port better custom firmware to this device in the future. My name is Taki, and I've been your host on this review. If you like what you saw here and you want to support my work, please consider dropping a like and subscribe to the channel for future videos. I'll catch you later with an installation guide for this firmware. Now go out and enjoy the rest of your day. Taki out.